Thanks for tuning in to another episode of First You Hustle. I'm your host, Jordan Bell. Today we have two segments. We'll discuss the technical rules of unpaid internships and why they exist, when you should avoid them like the plague, and when you might consider doing one. But first, we're going to check in with some CCAD interns. As we near the end of another semester, another cohort of CCAD students are finishing up internships on site. While our second segment is about unpaid internships, I'm happy to report that all the students you'll be hearing from are in paid positions. In fact, looking at the last couple years, most students doing internships for credit are actually getting paid too. On average, only one-sixth of the interns are doing an unpaid position. That means 83% of internships are paid. But we'll get more into paid versus unpaid later. First, let's hear a little bit about the experiences our students had, you know, besides collecting a paycheck. I sat down with three students who told me about their experiences. Ash Thomas, who is at Pixel Park, a animation and motion graphics studio. Sam Collins, who is working at Mad River Mountain, a ski resort, about 45 minutes outside of Columbus. And then Joshua Smukol, who had a shorter commute coming from our very own student design agency here at the Columbus College of Art and Design. My first question to them was how they found their internship. I first found them on Instagram because they've hired a lot of previous like CCD students that interned there and worked there and um, I saw their work and was really feeling like uh, it was it meshed well with the kind of work that I make or that I wanted to make. It just sounded like a perfect opportunity to gain some more experience and to have a position as a lead videographer. When I was 17 or 18, I actually had to job shadow somebody for uh, my career school that I was going to. And I job shadowed the former marketing director at the ski resort. And um, this was like kind of before YouTube and like Instagram and all that were really popular. Um, But I really liked the idea that he like kind of got to create these designs and promote these events and kind of like the... Um, he, you know, he just had this vision and he got to kind of create that. That was his job. Um, so as a kid, I thought like, wow, that's the coolest thing ever, you mm-hmm. know? And I found out they were going to be at the career fair and I made a reel and a portfolio and just kind of went for it. <laughs> nice. What were some of your goals going into this position that you wanted to like get out of the internship? Um, I wanted to get more experience working with client feedback Um, and just, uh, something that would make me feel, um, like more prepared once I graduated because I haven't really had any experience working in like a pipeline or working in an office setting and I'm an illustration major. So you don't always have to work in an office setting. You can do freelance. And I was trying to figure out what I was more suited towards Mm -hmm. for like the future. Again, like kind of being really connected with this, uh, resort, I knew a lot of like, um, kind of the avenues they were pursuing already. And one of the avenues they weren't really pursuing was like social media and kind of really building a strong audience and also um, putting out kind of, uh, they didn't put out like super strong content or things that were really designed. It just didn't look very professional, especially for a resort that like, um, you know, a multi-million dollar resort. Mm -hmm. You would think that they would just have like some, they look a little bit more professional. So, one of the main thing I did, one of my biggest goals was to just kind of take this, you know, multi-million dollar resort that should look very professional and like make it look professional. I wanted to create a uh, a setting where it would be different than just working there as a videographer. Mm-hmm. So, you know, asking myself what exactly would would a lead videographer do like why is that so different from videographer and to be honest it's not too much but I've definitely had a lot more producing roles and and tasks within it so that was a huge start of it and um, I mean producing has became a a goal of mine through the experience. Mm -hmm. What would you say are some of the most significant things that you've learned in the position since taking it? I've found more more leadership skills you know how to manage a team of people and as I mentioned producing that's just 
something that I wasn't quite expecting, but it it's came into play and I feel like I've been able to handle it pretty comfortably and naturally. Um, just being able to meet deadlines and make sure my my teammates are meeting deadlines. And I took the motion for illustration class at CCD and um, it kind of teaches you about like uh, the software and like some of like the creative side of coming up with uh, making something that's like animated in After Effects, but it didn't really teach a lot about the process of working with a client too much. Mm -hmm. And I have learned a lot about um, becoming very like adaptable and flexible through my experience at Pixel Park. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the main things I learned was, um, you know, the importance of time. And so you can spend days, you know, at school we have these projects that go on for weeks and sometimes months. Um, and one of the things I learned about this position, and this isn't like across the board for all kinds of positions like this, but that, you know, sometimes, like I said, the message changes every day. So you got to be kind of quick. And so whereas, you know, here at school, I have weeks to design a graphic or a visual there, I would have sometimes a couple hours. And so one of the, the biggest things I learned was to constantly like keep your momentum going. If you sit down for 15 minutes and you get sluggish, like that's going to kind of impact the rest of your day. So speaking of that, how, how is the, your work in the co-op differed from work you've done in the classroom or kind of personal projects that you may have been working on? I would say having a boss. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course in the classroom you, you have an instructor, but I mean, you're getting, realistically, you're getting paid for this. So, I mean, in a classroom setting, the teacher and the classmates can, can give suggestions and, you know, you could consider them or not consider them. And, but I think when I'm working for this and having a boss give their say, um, it, I mean, it's important to negotiate um, I really have found my voice in working on projects. Like, I really think this would be more effective and then, you know, kind of talking it through. And sometimes it's it's their final say regarding the boss. Like, um, There's definitely a lot more restrictions working with a client, but I kind of like that because it gives me more of a direction to go in. Um, and kind of grasp more of how my work uh, is presenting to someone else that's not me, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Like, um, I can do something on my own and think that it's doing something, but I don't really know how it's coming across to someone that thinks completely differently from how I think. What were some things that you found difficult to do in the internship as far as like, the, like what what would you say is the most difficult like professional thing you had to do like I I've never done this before I'm not quite sure how to do it was there anything like that oh totally I would say um, uh, you know creating um, you know one thing I did recently was since the season closed um, it, or since the season was over we had we still have things to promote and so kind of making this marketing plan for the month of April um, that was kind of different to me you know instead of because every day I'm just kind of enacting it. Like it's in my head, but like kind of putting it on paper and mm -hmm. um, showing it and especially being visual and the people I'm showing it to aren't necessarily like visual thinking. That was kind of a challenge. And then, you know, meetings, like just going into meetings. Um, I think that's something like we don't think of as designers and creatives is like, we just think like, oh, we're sitting in front of our computer and we're making stuff. But like, sometimes you have to go into these meetings and like explain why you're doing the things you're doing mm -hmm. to people who aren't creatives. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of a challenge. Is there anything you would do differently in the internship? I know you're still in the position, but like thinking back to when you started is if you were starting all over again tomorrow, is there anything you do differently on day one? Um, I'd be a lot less nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, yeah, I feel like, um, like being afraid, like getting caught up on the anticipation of messing up you know, on your first time working in like a, in, in an internship, it can like shake you a little bit. At least it did for me. Mm -hmm. I 
was very afraid of um, like messing up or like doing the wrong thing. But then I had nothing to worry about. You know, it's just they're incredibly nice people um, and they're you're there to learn and they're going to help you. Mm hmm. And what's your working relationship like with your team and, and your supervisors? Everyone's super close. They're all really, really fun to be around. Um, yeah, there's like, there. I have no complaints. I like was so fortunate with the environment that I'm working in. Mm -hmm. So. And speaking of that environment, is that something you vision being the type of place you'd want to work full time, like a small studio like that with just a handful of people doing that type of work? Or do you vision yourself working in a different space, bigger company, different mission? You know, what, what type of companies are you looking at and how consistent is it with where you are now? I think if I'm going to work for a company, I, I prefer smaller companies because I think there's more, um, like room to be creative in those kinds of companies. Uh, Pixel Park in particular, like they work with a lot of um, bigger companies like Nationwide and Big Lots and those kinds of places. And it's a lot of fun to see like how that process works. But then they also work with like startups and like smaller groups and experiment and have a lot of fun with the kind of work that they're producing. And that's something that I want to do. The last question is, would you work for this organization? Would you want to work for this organization full time? And I kind of get the sense of what the answer might be because you mentioned having a good working relationship with everyone and kind of enjoying what you do. So maybe look at it more from like, would you want to work for a, like a single nonprofit brand? Like think about more of the environment, like this type of job or are your career ambitions kind of maybe looking at other areas? Like you want to branch into something different. My end goal is to solely be a director of photography and that primarily focuses on, you know, cameras and lighting, uh, studying more of the visuals and lighting. Going forward, I would like to only focus on the technical and visual standpoint and lighting mm -hmm. as well, uh, opposed to doing everything so there were times when I thought like, oh man, like <laughs> I want to do something else. Mm -hmm. um, but I had to remind myself, like, I'm very fortunate. This is a really cool position. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'm doing is, is really fun and it's right up my alley. Um, but with that being said, one of the things that I noticed, which I kind of spoke about a little bit was like, there were times when I only had like an hour to like, let people know we're, we're closing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And, uh, especially being a creative, I want that to visually look appealing. So there were times when I had an hour to like make something I, I wanted to be good. It, and it necessarily didn't turn out good. So after this experience, um, I mean, I'm still doing, I, I still love this job and I am going to continue doing it. But I think down the road, um, I, obviously I'm young and this isn't, I'm not going to be there forever right. down the road. I would really want to work for a company like where we have a month or maybe even longer to work on these projects and these ideas. And I'm working on a team of other creatives. And so I think that the end product is a lot stronger in that case when you're working mm -hmm. with other people and you have teams, um, and it's a lot more meaningful too. So in the future, I'd like to work on like maybe more at a studio and like more, with other creatives and people who have like a, a bigger vision in mind. Some like across the board advice I got from uh, Matt, the owner, and Kelly Sells, who's in charge of business development there. They both like on separate occasions, we have intern talks um, where each of the supervisors um, and people in the company sit down with the interns and just give them advice and tell them things that they wish that they'd known uh, going into like starting their career. And they both said, uh, find a mentor and like meet with them for coffee, like once a month and just like ask them for advice and like, kind of like, um, tell each other about what you're doing and mm -hmm. like kind of build off of that. So that's something I'm still looking for, but I don't know if I'm going to give any advice. I think vicariously through them, that advice. <laughs> yeah, that is good advice. Even though you're still seeking it out yourself, yeah. it's good that you recognize that like yeah. I, that I need to have that journey, you know, mm -hmm. find that mentor. That's, that is good advice. Well, thank you for sharing some of your experiences uh, with Pixel Park. Sounds like things are going really well, and it's uh, good to hear from you. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing your experiences. It yeah. sounds like it was a really uh, fun and fast-paced environment. Totally. Yeah, it was It was fast. Every day. Yeah. So I'm 
and and so for the past few weeks i've been able to get some downtime and like rest i've been like sleeping so much <laughs> <That's> so good <laughs> well thanks for uh waking up and coming in and talking to us yeah no problem thank, thank you well thanks all for sharing uh some of your thoughts on your experience sounds like it's been a good one so far yeah definitely appreciate cool. it thank you all right As I mentioned earlier, for every six internships that seek credit, we're finding one of those tends to be unpaid. The culture around unpaid internships has changed drastically, which means that less employers are offering unpaid internships because there's now actually a legal definition for what an unpaid internship should be. But nonetheless, the world of unpaid internships is still pretty murky. On the employer side, many will cite unpaid internships as being necessary to get your foot in the door. And it's something they had to go through when they were starting out. On the student side, they'll cite the lack of getting money makes it hard to, you know, live a life. So who's right and who's wrong? Well, the legal rules around unpaid internships don't make a distinction, but they do provide some guidelines on what makes some in unpaid internships more okay than others. Before we get into that, though, let's go through some myths and truths. If someone is offering an unpaid internship and they're justifying it solely because they had to do an unpaid internship when they were young and it's the, quote, way to get into the industry, well, that's not really a strong reason. Just because there's precedent doesn't mean it's the best practice moving forward. Many industries have gotten wise to this. Unpaid internships used to be extremely common in the magazine industry, but then a series of lawsuits changed that. Now you'll find less opportunities available at the big publishers, but when they do offer something, it's paid. So the key takeaway for you as the job seeker is to be skeptical. Ask questions. Don't take everything for face value, especially when it's chalked up to, you know, we've always done it this way. That might not mean it's the best way to keep doing it. An unpaid internship is essentially a volunteer position. That means you have all the power for negotiation and ultimately the power to not take the position. Keep this in mind. It is hard to define black and white policy for unpaid internships. This means you're going to see them advertised. You might even consider applying to some, but that in no way means that you have to take those jobs. After this segment, you'll be able to identify what makes an unpaid internship predatory or exploitive, and those are the ones you'll want to avoid, or maybe even draw some attention to for removal if they're real bad. I'll also share a few productive ways to react to unpaid internship offerings, because the options actually go beyond just deciding whether or not you're going to apply. And keep in mind the context for where you are working. Unpaid internships at nonprofit organizations tend to be seen as okay because a nonprofit organization can utilize volunteers. But nonprofits are not all one size. Large nonprofits operate more like corporations. And in that case, they're likely to have the means to pay, but aren't. A small nonprofit might not have that means to pay. In some nonprofit industries, volunteering is actually the way to start. It's true, it gets your foot in the door and then you can move up from there. But that tends to be a more mission-driven career. Is the company a startup? Maybe no one is making money at the company. As an intern, would you potentially have a stake in the company's success? Would you position yourself for being hired into a role once the company takes off? Much like the people who create startups, that type of an unpaid internship may be seen as an investment on your end. But there are some things to consider before jumping into an unpaid internship at a startup. And we'll cover that more in a bit. So what makes an unpaid internship okay? Well, through the eyes of the U.S. Department of Labor, there's actually a seven-pronged test for unpaid internships. This has been updated fairly recently due to some circuit court rulings. So you may have heard some of these before, but they also may have changed. Okay, the first rule is one. The extent to which the intern and the employer clearly understand that there is no expectation of compensation. Any promise of compensation expressed or implied suggests that the intern is an employee and vice versa. Okay, this one's fairly easy to interpret. If you take a position, make sure it is very clear about whether it is paid or not. A position may be as advertised as paid, but it could be vague. You know, they say things like, payment only comes if the work produces revenue. Payment is something they will consider after performance reviews. Things like this. Don't take that to mean you're getting any money. Employers shouldn't word things as wishy-washy on payment. Make sure they are clear. When you start, this is an unpaid internship and you should not expect to receive payment now or later. Hey, if that changes, that's great. But don't buy promises for potential income later. Know that when all is said and done, this position will end without payment received. 
If an employer does promise you pay and then doesn't pay you claiming you were an unpaid intern, this is where that rule would be part of your legal strategy for challenging the employer to pay you. Rule two, the extent to which the internship provides training that would be similar to that which would be given in an educational environment, including the clinical or other hands-on training provided by education institutions. This one is about how much training you're receiving and the quality of that training. Is your unpaid internship with an expert in the field? Someone who can do the work and has done it professionally? If not, then you are essentially an unpaid freelancer, which is not legal unless you are volunteering your time for a nonprofit organization. So make sure your supervisor is knowledgeable in the trade. Then make sure there are steps for training you and make sure you aren't doing an unpaid internship in an area that you could take a class in. For example, if you want to learn Photoshop and think an unpaid internship will help you learn that, it won't be as robust as an actual course. So if your college offers a course in that, take that instead. But sometimes you might learn a depth of a skill or a skill not available at your college. These are potentially good reasons to consider an unpaid internship. If you have zero experience in Photoshop and won't learn it as part of your degree program, it is highly unlikely someone will pay you to do Photoshop. An unpaid internship will give you that training experience that then you can use to get paid work. Just make sure there is a clear structure for getting trained. Self-paced learning is not training. Training means you're getting critical feedback and notes for improvement continuously. Your supervisor can't rely on you doing work for the company by company standards, but they can train you to learn and eventually be able to perform at that level by the end of the internship. Think of it this way. In a classroom, you get bad grades and a lot of critical feedback if you don't do something right. In the workplace, you get fired. What should happen in an unpaid internship? They should react more like a classroom teacher would. What went wrong? How will you improve? Will you have more chances to demonstrate improvement? That's much more of a training mentality than an employment mentality. Here's a hypothetical, just to drive the point further. Let's say you have an unpaid internship and your supervisor asks you to put together a slide deck for a client presentation, and you've never really done this before. But by doing some research and looking at past examples, you cobble something together. The presentation goes miserably. The client's not pleased. You made a lot of mistakes. So who's to blame? If your supervisor says you, they are wrong. You are a trainee. The supervisor is the one responsible for the work that company produces. If they relied on you as an unpaid internship, they should get blamed when it doesn't go right. They should have reviewed your work, made improvements, or shown you where you could improve. In fact, they should have shown you what a slide deck for a client presentation is and what the company standards are. You should just be assisting on that project, not spearheading it. Now imagine the same situation, but you're paid. You're an employee. Then it's on you when it doesn't go right. A paid intern is essentially a part-time employee, so you'll face the same repercussions a paid employee would receive. Okay, let's continue with the Department of Labor rules. We're up to number three. The extent to which the internship is tied to the intern's formal education program by integrated coursework or the receipt of academic credit. This one is about whether you are doing the position as part of your pursuit for a degree. Are you getting credit? Here's something a lot of job seekers and employers don't know. The only entity that can promise you academic credit is an accredited institution of higher education, AKA a college. If a company advertises that they can provide credit, they can't. The company provides no credit. Only a college provides credit. I see this all the time. Our company promises college credit. No, unless your company is a college, you cannot receive credit from a company. You receive credit from the college. That means unpaid internships for credits need to meet the standards of what the college has deemed worthy of credit. That differs at every college. I've seen advertised unpaid internships that promise college credit, but then the hours the intern would be working are far below what the college will grant credit for. A 100 hour internship may be worth one credit at some colleges and no credit at others. Essentially, the employer doesn't get to make the distinction of whether the position is credit eligible or not. You coordinate that with your college. When you see positions that promise credit, ask your college if it meets the standards. At CCAD, we require 240 hours of work on site with clear demonstration that the position meets the Department of Labor standards, including that it is supervised by someone with expertise in the field, but other colleges may have different standards. For us, 240 equals three credits. For other colleges, they might only grant one credit. It's different everywhere. Okay, on with the standards. Number four, the extent to which the internship accommodates the intern's academic commitments by corresponding to the academic calendar. 
Essentially, this one's fairly straightforward. It means that the internship duration should be within the terms you are receiving credit. If you are required to do an internship and get credit for it, then the unpaid internship should accommodate start and end dates that match up to your semester. It should also accommodate other classes you are taking concurrently. Unpaid internships should be flexible. You should prioritize your classwork before an unpaid internship, but it should be able to fit in, and your employer should work with you on that. Number five, the extent to which the internship's duration is limited to the period in which the internship provides the intern with beneficial learning. This one essentially means that an unpaid internship should have a clear end date, and it should be relatively short, in my opinion, one semester or one term. An unpaid internship should not extend indefinitely. In fact, the internship should end as soon as you, the intern, are confident in the skills needed required for the job and you don't need any additional training. You could start doing the work as paid. That should be your signal to end the internship. This is the time to get out of the internship and then go find paid work. That could be with your current employer, but there's no promise of that. As the saying goes, why buy the cow when you get the milk for free? And that's true for interns as it is in other places that phrase is applied. Uh, so a lot of times if you can do the work and get paid for it, the employer isn't gonna magically start paying you if they weren't before, but it had us happen. Some employers will structure a three or four month unpaid internship period that's meant to lead to employment, but there should be no promise of that either. And we'll get to that in a little bit. So once you feel like you can get paid for it, you're probably gonna need to go elsewhere to find work. For employers, they should plan on an unpaid internship having a lot of turnover. If they need you to do, for example, video production work, then they should be prepared to always have someone in training for that position if they won't be paying. That means you might be the editor for their videos, let's say for a three to four month period before you leave, and then it's time to find someone else. Since you are essentially a volunteer as an unpaid internship, make sure you know when to walk away. Always be looking for paid work. If you get lured out of an unpaid internship, you should have zero hard feelings about leaving it for something paid because I've seen this a little bit too. Some students feel trapped in an unpaid internship where they don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. But if someone is hurt because you want to go find paid work and they're not paying you, that's on them. That's not on you. Never feel bad about that. Okay, number six. The extent to which the intern's work complements rather than displaces the work of a paid employee while providing significant educational benefits to the intern. This is the one that's been contested recently, and the circuit court has an updated version since uh, 2016. It used to be that any benefit to the employer was in violation of this guideline. However, the courts now seem flexible. Basically, they say if it's a win-win situation, then it's okay. If the company gets some benefit and you get benefit, then all is good. But what is a benefit? If the company makes tons of money off your work and you get a experience for your portfolio, that's not really a fair trade-off. So I would say the benefit is balanced unfavorably towards the company, and that would be in violation of this rule. Make sure going into a position that you are not heavily relied on for creating the work of the company. If you are in charge of a logo design, and that logo will bring in customers, create brand awareness, and you know, do the things that generate commerce, then you're giving away your work for free. I mean, you're giving away thousands of dollars of work for free. Don't do that. If you work as part of a creative team that trains you on the inner workings of brand development by having you assist with some tags, then that is more of a fair trade-off. If the company can point to someone who is getting paid and say they were ultimately responsible for the work, that without you, they would have produced the same quality of work, then they are likely in compliance with this rule. And that's what it's all about. If you are replacing or invaluable to a company, you know, you're doing work that no one else there could do, then they are violating this rule by not paying you. This goes back to knowing when you have exhausted the internship. When you stop getting significant educational benefits, it is time to go. When you start being relied on for producing work, it is time to go. And I say go because really it's time to get paid, but there's no promise the company will start paying you. Go find paid work elsewhere. I mean, it's worth a try. Ask your employer to start paying you, but don't be surprised if they say they really can't do that because if they could, they would have been paying you all along. Okay, the last one, number seven. This is the extent to which the intern and the employer understand that the internship is conducted without entitlement to a paid job at the conclusion of the internship. Many positions will advertise that they are looking for an intern that could turn into a full-time position. Just know that unpaid internships cannot promise you a position. You are not entitled to a position with the company afterward. As with rule number one, 
This internship should be expected to end without payment and without employment. If that changes, great. That's in your favor. But the expectation should be set that you will not be paid and you will not be working there. If you go in with that expectation, then you won't be upset. You won't be surprised when you don't receive payment or don't receive a job because it's known going in. So number one and number seven sometimes seem self-explanatory, but if the job description is being vague or they're kind of floating these implications, you need to know as an unpaid internship that not to expect that to happen, not to take the position expecting it to happen because legally they are not obligated to do that. So what should you do if you see unpaid internships? That's the big question. You're going to see these advertised. So how should you react? Well, I would say the first thing you do is compare it to the test. We just went through the seven rules and job descriptions are vague. So you won't be able to get clear answers, but there's some things you can look for that will be helpful. Does the job description require experience in certain areas? You know, if that's the case, then that kind of implies that they're looking for someone uh, that can be giving value straight to the company. That's in violation of rule number six. And why do you need experience? The context is going to be important. So maybe a job description says you need experience in some areas. And right off the bat, that may or may not be a bad thing. If it's so that you can build on top of it by learning advanced techniques or new processes, that's good. Maybe they say you need to know basic understanding of Photoshop so that we can teach you some really advanced things and you can get trained on you know, using the advanced features of Photoshop. Great, you need that baseline to learn something new. You're learning something new, you're getting trained, you're fine. Or if they require basic understanding of Photoshop so that you can perform duties that directly benefit the company, you know, doing light Photoshop work, touching up their photos for publishing, things like that, that's work. You're displacing an employee, you're giving value to the company without really receiving fair benefit in return. So if they require you to know something, chances are they want to exploit that. They want to use it for profit. And that's in violation of rule six. So really make sure that any baseline qualifications you need are going to be used for your benefit to train on top of that. So if they don't specify, I just say, assume the latter, assume they're taking advantage of you. Um, but you know, if you are skeptical, you can always apply and then you're going to find out more in the internship. And like I said before, you're always in the, the driver's seat to walk away. So remember that but could be that they're violating rule number six. Second thing you can do, determine the value for you. I mean, this is something you can do without even seeing the job description. Just right now, consider what is the value for you? What do you need to, to for a job for your career? Because this is very subjective and it will change for every person. Some positions might provide value to you, but not to someone else. So what is the value to you? Do you get to get trained on equipment, techniques, process, you know, skills, things that you wouldn't find in the classroom, or at least you don't get a depth of experience in the classroom? Is it affordable? Think about that. An unpaid internship means you're actually going to dip into your own pocket for something, transportation, gas, lost wages from taking time away from a part-time job. So what investment are you making? A nearby 10 to 15 hour per week unpaid internship is a lot easier on the wallet than a long commute to a position that has you working for 20 to 30 hours per week. So consider what the value is to you. What do you get out of it? Is it worthwhile for you? And on that note, I suggest never to do anything unpaid for more than 20 hours per week. 20 hours is pretty solidly part-time. On top of classes, that's a lot of time commitment. After 20 hours per week, you're likely being relied on to perform duties that you should be getting paid for. It's likely going beyond training. So as a rough rule, I suggest that you avoid working 25, 30, 40 hours a week unpaid, especially full-time unpaid positions. I mean, it's crazy to me to think that those are even a thing anymore, unpaid full-time work. Uh, you should never do that. The, very rarely will you find full-time unpaid work that meets all of those Department of Labor standards without at some point going beyond them and violating them. So based on what you come up with, here's how you can actually react. What action do you take on the job description? One, you can ignore the posting and choose not to apply. That's probably what you're going to do to most. You're just going to say, okay, good try, but not for me. Two, you could decide this is worthwhile or potentially worthwhile, and it's going to give you fair value in exchange for not receiving payment. Uh, and, and decide to apply. So throughout this, I've kind of, you know, not danced around the fact that there are sometimes times where you'll do an unpaid internship and that's okay. Just make sure that you're getting that value exchange. So if that's the case, that's the second thing you can do. You could decide to apply. 
Third way to react to an unpaid internship. You could reach out to the person and inquire about doing the position paid. Now, this is straight up sales. So they're saying, hey, we need you to do this thing. We don't want to pay you. And if you want to call their bluff on that, if you really think their job description is not going to net anyone that uh, will do the job unpaid, you can say, hey, here's my portfolio. Here's what I can do. And this is the rate that I, that I charge. And they can decide yes or no. And maybe, just maybe, they'll see that the applications that they're getting for the unpaid position are pretty subpar, and what you're offering is actually what they need, and they'll decide to pay for it. It's basically like if I ask someone to build me a Lamborghini for free, and everyone's portfolio shows me you know, wheelbarrows that they made, but you show me a car that you made, but you say it's going to cost me, then I'm going to start to re-decide, uh, rethink you know, who I'm going to for this work. And the last one, if it's truly predatory and malicious, then make sure you report it because you want to avoid people falling into, you know, potential trap of unpaid work. So if there are things that are clearly in violation of that seven rule test, bring it to the attention of wherever you saw it posted. If it's at your college, let your career services office know. If it's with a job board, use the contact us feature. Maybe they have a report feature, uh, but go back to value. Is it not valuable for you? That doesn't mean it's not valuable for someone else. But if it's truly malicious and taking advantage of people, then do report it. Do do the community a favor. And the most important thing you can do in regards to unpaid internships is to know your worth. And we talked about that a little bit. But know what wage your work and skills can realistically take in and hold yourself to that. Avoid applying to unpaid internships or settling for them because you don't think you'll be able to find anything else. Chances are you haven't really looked hard enough for unpaid work. We have a past episode on what to do when you are stuck in your job search. It's called The Small Things, and it's worth a listen to make sure you are exploring all your options. If everyone stuck to their value and avoided unpaid internships, then the market would adjust and start paying for those positions. But as long as someone is willing to work for free, employers will try to advertise positions for it. So don't be that person who thinks you need to work unpaid because chances are you don't. And I have successfully talked students out of unpaid internships. I've seen students come in and they say, I have this unpaid internship. I need to do it. It's the only thing I could find. I say, you know what? I'll approve it if you really want to do it, but not before you give it another shake. Go out there, try to find paid work. I believe you can do it. Looking at your portfolio, looking at your skills, you should be getting paid for this. And then happy to report that. In most cases, they come back and they say, Hey, I was able to find paid work. And, you know, there was one time that a student said, no, I still want to do the unpaid work because I'm going to be able to learn something that I can't learn with my current skills. It's like, all right, as long as you know that that's the value exchange you're getting, then an unpaid internship for a short amount of time is okay. But for the most part, you're better than it. Trust me, you have good creative work. You are someone with more skills than you lead on. So look for paid work and make it be a market decision. The market isn't paying me, I've tried, I've looked everywhere I can, so I need to do an unpaid internship for a strategic reason. That's the only reason to do it.